Well, thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. Um, in fact, my apologies that uh, uh, Joyce Coffey couldn't be here to talk about this. She was the original person to do this. Um, but uh, she has the flu and I decided to save her the air flight <laughs> in coming here and we've worked together quite closely before. Um, firstly, just me, let me just say a couple of things about myself. Uh, there was a quick introduction, but um, uh, I've been an academic for 25 years. I went to the World Bank because they gave an opportunity to put into practice something that I've been working on for, for many years, uh, just a one-year secondment, and 12 years later I retired from the World Bank, um, having shifted from mitigation to adaptation. So I, I keep on changing my career around quite a bit in this area, and this was another, yet another change. Also, I was, I, yes, I was an author of one of the major IPCC chapters on adaptation, but I am not talking on behalf of the IPCC today. So therefore, I may be policy prescriptive and I may break some of the IPCC rules, um, but I'm not, this is not an IPCC talk. Um, so it's good to be free of the bank and free of IPCC for the first time in, in, in years. Um, what I'm going to come to is an index that some of us have been building over the last couple of years. Um, and I'll, I'll come to the, the background of that and why we're doing it um, in the latter part of the, the talk. The, we've heard already a lot of the results from the IPCC, and they produce graphs like this, which are actually, when you look at them and study them, they're very meaningful. In fact, um, this is actually about changes in, I think this is actually cereals in general, uh, how, think, how cereal production will change, and basically what this means is that the areas where cereal production gets better is declining through time, and the areas where it gets worse is increasing in through time. It's, but it's very hard to understand at all, and it's very hard to communicate. So let's just get to some of the core messages that came out of the adaptation area in the IPCC. And this is not just from the IPCC, this is what is becoming well established amongst the, the development community and many communities in, in developed countries. First message is that adaptation is needed now. Now, this is for several reasons. One, we are not mitigating to anywhere near the extent that we need to. So we've committed ourselves to a large degree of climate change, in fact, a sufficient degree of climate change that we're going to have to, uh, well, in fact, we're seeing it already. We've heard people talking about we're going to have to make changes and quite significant changes. But uh, you, know, I've well, one just simple example. We were talking to a group of farmers in in India, and we asked them certain things. Have you seen changes in rainfall patterns? Yes. Has this affected your crops? Yes. What are you doing about it? We're we doing this, this, and this. Do you have any idea what might be the cause of this? And there was actual consternation amongst the, the whole group. They were talking to each other for quite some time. They finally came back and said, "You're from the World Bank, and you don't know about climate change." <laughs> So people have been re responding already, and in fact in many parts of the world, that knowledge is there. But of course, knowledge does not always mean that you can act. Sometimes there are other greater pressures which stop you from acting. Uh, sometimes you do not know what to do. One of the themes that's also coming through, and I don't want this to be sort of a, sort of a Pollyanna-ish Pollyanna type statement, but in actual fact, effective adaptation creates opportunities. It creates opportunities to change. It can often be the stimulus for very positive change, especially in developing countries. Um, and, and this, in fact, is part of the, uh, one of the, 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 strong, the strengths of adaptation in developing countries. It's also one of the problems. But it also applies in developed countries. Um, the opportunity is to change the way we use our cities, to cha change the way we use our agricultural lands. So adaptation is... Now, it's needed now, it's happening now, and there are opportunities to move ahead. But a major chapter in the IPCC report talks about the limits to adaptation. So unless we actually 
get moving on the mitigation side that we are going to run into extremely uh, un, un, extreme conditions that we really would prefer not to see. Now, one of the big issues in the, negoti in the negotiations at the moment, and I also have a certain increasing degree of cynicism about the entire climate change negotiations, and I think I've been to, I don't know how many Mark's been to, but you know, I, I think my, my count's up to about 10 of these so far, so I've spent hundreds of days sitting in these meetings. Um, but the crunch is coming next year at the meeting in Paris, late, late in the year, uh, where essentially major decisions have to be made. Behind that is a fund called the Green Climate Fund. And this came out of a meeting a couple of years ago in Cancun where it was decided that about $100 billion per year would be necessary for mitigation and adaptation um, by 2020. And this is a flow from developed countries to developing countries. Now, how those numbers were established, um, we could talk about that over lunch maybe or later. About half of that money will go to, go to adaptation. So there is a, immediately a question. $50 billion per year is a significant amount of money. I mean, the US, if it's contributing to this, will be contributing some five, ten billion dollars, and you cannot do that out of petty cash. You're going to have to justify who you, where it goes, and how it's spent. And this is why I come, I'm going to come back to talking about indices and measuring adaptation, because it is going to be an increasing challenge. I can sk almost skip this slide because I was going to point out that it's not just the development world, et cetera, et cetera, that are worried about climate change, but the whole security area. But Mark's covered this much more effectively than I have. But I can point out that it was in 1992 that I first took part in a, what I'm not supposed to talk about, but I think I can at least say it now after 26 years, whatever it is, 22 years, um, a military assessment of what the implications of climate change would be to security. And uh, I was amazed at the level of knowledge. I'd spent 20 years working with scientists trying to get climate change research and, and get into the agenda. These people are on top of everything in that area. So it's not surprising we've seen this interest that Mark talked about that coming through. They recognise the risk early and have been watching and acting. One of the other areas that um, I've been surprised by how quickly things have changed is in the wider business community. By wider business community, I'm talking about things like the World Economic Forum. Um, it's really the big business groups. And they, for now, for nine years, have been producing a list of what they call the global risks to the, to the business environment. Now, if you go back to the uh, original ones, you do not see issues um, like, well, what we see here now. Well, yes, financial crisis and key economies have always been there. Unemployment issues have always been there. But now we see amongst the top ten, and what, was hap what happened here was that uh, everybody at these, these meetings was asked to vote against 31 separate risks, and these are the top ten. We see that four of them are directly related to climate, and one of them is directly climate change, the failure to mitigate uh, and adapt to climate change in time. So you can see how quickly that part of the economic community has recognised the problem and see it right up there in the top, top list. Another activity is the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is an attempt to get companies to both disclose their um, carbon emissions, which really was a, a way of getting them to measure their carbon emissions and become aware of what was happening, to exchange information about how they're tackling this, uh, and, and from that, uh, gradually learn from each other. I mean, there is cooperation within, within the business community on many of these issues. Where companies are faced with a lack of knowledge, the best thing to do is to talk to each other 
and work, work through what, what, can be, what can be done. But we see here at the moment that more than 70% of the respondents saw risks to their supply or value chains from climate disruption. And we see many situations now where companies are acting not just to protect the, their, their physical business, um, but to think more widely. Um, I won't name the company, but one company which started building essentially dikes to protect crop growing areas or in, in a tropical area, then suddenly realised that this was very effective. When they had a storm surge, the crops were not damaged. However, nobody turned up to the factories in the next, for about the next one or two weeks because they, the village was flooded and they couldn't come to work. So they realised that as part of their business model, they had to also help protect the village and protect those people's whole, whole livelihoods so that they could actually come to work on, on this sort of process. So it was a sensible business decision. Now, I'm not saying all companies are doing this, of course. Many are not. But you know, it, it is there and it's happening and it's happening quickly. Now, let, let me just talk quickly about the gain index. Um, I spent many years in the bank refusing to produce an index of vulnerability of countries because it could be misused, you'd never get a perfect index, etc. But I was persuaded by a, a, um, a senior businessman who'd also been the, the, essentially the finance minister in a, in a small country to, he said, I need something like this so that when I'm talking to people, I've got a way of capturing their attention. I want to raise awareness. I said, okay, for something like that, I think we can produce an index, which is what we've done. It's, very, it's based at the country level. It lets you see how countries rank against each other, and it creates curiosity. Why is our neighbouring country ahead of us? What, what, how did they get there? Why aren't we ahead, ahead? It's based on vulnerability, which is uh, essentially covers a number of very important sectors uh, that, that affect uh, a country's well-being. You can read them now. I'm not going to read them off myself, and we've heard about some of them already. But it, and each of those is measured by a series of measures, again, which I'm not going to go through in detail, but there are about 34 different measures that go into estimating the vulnerability of a country. There's also what we call readiness. And a readiness measure is the, the readiness of a country to actually absorb investment and use it effectively. We know that certain countries, can, money can be used effectively, that levels of corruption are low, um, there's efficient banking systems, etc. Other countries, those things are lacking. So there's this me other, other measure of readiness. And so we choose to show this on a double axis. More vulnerable countries up here, more ready countries over here. Obviously, the USA, etc., Australia, I think this is Denmark down here. And out here, we have, well, Myanmar, this I think is Zimbabwe. The interesting thing is we, collect, we make sure that the variables we use have a time series. So we can go back to 1995, and if you go to the web page, you'll see this dynamically. And you can see countries moving. You can see, you know, actually, I'll tell you that the USA has gone sort of from here to about here, then back again for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Zimbabwe's gone like that. There's a lot of interesting things just watching that dynamic. But also, that also leads to more questions. Why is it happening? So the index itself is not the critical issue. It's the data that's behind it. And people can look at how different components of the index, how they're changing with time, and then focus in on those issues. And we can provide a lot more background information. So the whole idea is to get awareness, get interest, asking, people asking questions as to what they can do. When we look at this overall, we see some good news in it. On the whole, countries are becoming slightly less, less vulnerable and many are becoming more ready. So on the whole, there is a move sort of this way, which is, a, which is in the, the good direction. It's down into this green area that we want countries to go. The, the bad news, or the less good news, is that it's far too slow. If we just ask the question, how long will it take the low-income countries, the LICs, um, to catch up to where the OECD average is at the moment, 
At current rates, it'll take them 110 years. It's even going to take the high-income countries 40 years plus years to catch up to the OECD average because, remember, the OECD does not include all high-income countries. Um, countries like Saudi Arabia has high income but, in fact, is very vulnerable in, in many ways. So the bad news there is that we're not moving fast enough and that's why we need more and more effort in this adaptation area. Now, is this useful? How do we tell? By usage. And we find that, yes, it is being used. People are finding it useful. Um, here's an example of uh, a charitable organisation, um, Catholic Relief Services, using it to guide them in where they put their investments. Um, another example of a company trying to make a decision, do we, do we set up a new plant in Liberia or Mali? And they could look at the information we had, look into the detail of the information to help them make that decision. Even just putting us forward in front of clients saying, do you realise the risks that are associated with the development in this country is a useful ploy because this can bring people to think about how they're going to handle the, the, the changing climate in the future. And it's already, again, being used by development agencies or equivalent to that, the World Food Programme, to, again, home in on certain countries. So even though th this is uh, an index in its earliest stages, we're still modifying it and changing it and trying to improve it, you can see, and, it's, it's, and it is far from perfect, but it is useful and usable and we're moving ahead. And we have to do a lot more work in this area if we are going to spend $50 billion a year, which I don't think we'll get, but $50 billion a year on adaptation. We are going to have to have even better measures if we're going to better justify that to the range of governments we have. I think that's it. Well, uh, we, there are also a whole series of uh, awards that the game's been involved in. I won't go through that. I can answer questions later. You may find it strange, some of those companies that are on there. I must admit, I had a bit of a debate about some of them. Um, <laughs> and um, we're looking forward. We're doing, looking forward to more detailed sector ass assessments, urban assessments, state assessments, final granularity, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, well, you're all invited to a meeting here in this Wilson Centre and uh, in a few months' time where we'll be talking about where we're going over the next year. Thank you.